football team returns home to host Nebraska on Saturday at 2.30 p.m. Game will be televised nationally by ABC. Head coach Gary Anderson is here. We'll have some opening comments and take questions. Okay, a couple notes off of last week's game I think are important. Uh, you know, Vince Beagle had a tremendous game, played very, very well. It was great to see him have such an impact on the game in a positive way. Uh, hopefully that can continue. And then, uh, you know, Melvin again just goes about his business. Uh, 200 yards and you know it would uh, you think he had like a 120 or 130 and the kid comes out of it with 200 yards and I think that's just a credit to how great a player he is and what he's been able to do and again hopefully that continues but I was proud of the offense the defense special teams all contributed we have plenty to work on um, as we look forward to this next game you know Nebraska obviously a quality opponent um, it's going to be fun it's it's going to be a great environment for us you know we have three games left this is the next one on the schedule and it's the uh, only game that matters. A lot of that is coach talk, but it's uh, it's really true. This is this is where Nebraska falls in the schedule, and we're excited to have the opportunity to prepare and get ready to play our next game. Jesse, Gary, I know every game is important, <coughs> but is this the most significant or meaningful game you believe your team has played at Camp Randall since you've been coach here, given what's uh, at stake? You know, I don't know. I, I I think it's all hard to say, and I hate to get into that. You know, everybody wants to talk about big games, and it's this and it's that. It's, uh, you know, we're going to approach it exactly the same. And the reason I say that is because a week from now we're going to be sitting here, and then we're going to say that that's a big game, or two or three weeks ago when we were getting ready to play, how big was that game? So we're going to prepare the same. And as a coach, I think it's important to allow the kids to prepare exactly the same and put them in a position. Um, if it gets built up as it's too big or it gets built up not good enough, then uh, I don't think it's good for the kids. And quite frankly, I don't think it's good for the coaches. So um, we're just going to prepare how we always prepare. Jeff. Gary, after the game, you mentioned that kickoff unit, the coverage, remains an area of concern yep. for you. When you looked at it, I'm assuming you did yesterday, what, what are some of the options you have? Were, were, were guys not in their lanes? Is it a personnel issue? Is it a schematic issue? How do you address that this week? Well, we're going to look at it in all those areas. Uh, number one, we, we've got we've to put the kick in a position to be able to uh, – cover the field to the best of our abilities. Uh, and that's just not all Andrew. That's not just pointing the finger at the kicker. It's the, it's the team in general. We have to give them an opportunity to put the ball where we can cover the best. We'll look at potential personnel scenarios. And you do that every single week, depending on the returners or what kind of return team what kind of schemes that they use, and we'll also look at that. But it's the whole, you know, the, the whole team. And when we have a problem, we're always going to look at ourselves as a whole, and we'll always look at it as coaches first. So, um, you know, we'll take a long, hard look at it and see what we can do to help them. But it, it, no question, it has to improve. Um, you know, getting the ball out to the 40-yard line is putting the defense in in a bad spot, and you know, we want to be able to improve in that area and it was it was so good for so many weeks and then it's uh, really tapered off and credit to the teams we've played but we've got to do all the areas better we got to cover better we got to coach it better uh, we got to kick it better um, if we do that you know we'll be okay because these guys got some really good returners back there and talented people blocking Jesse this is an offense that's averaging over 40 points per game this season what in your mind makes that offense so effective and how much does Amir's return impact that well, you'll be surprised when I say this, but uh, it's players, <laughs> there is no magic schemes. Very good coaches, again, like there always is in this league week in and week out. But, you know, there, there's talented players all over the field. Um, quarterback can hurt you in every way a quarterback, uh, you, in, in every way you want a quarterback to hurt you and every way that you don't want a quarterback to hurt you from a defensive standpoint. He makes good decisions. Uh, their check with me game looking over to the sideline is very good. It's ran, you know, through the coaches to the players, and I think they handle that very, very well. And then they got the personnel on top of it, and the quarterback can also hurt you with his legs. Obviously, you know, the the running back um, Abdul is fantastic. Uh, he cuts on a dime. He's fast. He's quick. He's physical. Catches the ball well. All that stuff. That uh, uh, he's a talented, talented young man, and all the accolades that. Uh, is talked about him having and that he's received in the past are definitely warranted. He's a tremendous back, and uh, the receivers are very, very good. The, you know, something that goes unnoticed with, with many times with our receivers at Wisconsin and also the receivers at Nebraska is they're very physical blockers. Nebraska takes great pride in blocking down the field, and with the amount of fly sweeps and things they do to get to the edges, it's a, it's a big part of their game. And the offensive line um, does a very, very nice job. They play a number of people. You'll see sometimes you know eight different kids kind of rotate in and out of that and even nine in certain scenarios. Um, 
The big left tackle stays in there almost all the time. I apologize for not knowing his name, um, number 71. But the other guys kind of roll through there. And one of the guards flips back and forth, the right guard le to left guard. And uh, they're all talented players. Not a big drop off when those other kids come in. And you know, tight ends and fullbacks. So that it's a good scheme. Uh, very talented players, and they do a tremendous job, I think, of getting the ball in their playmakers' hands. Zach? Gary, do you have an update on Conrad Zygzebski and, and as well as maybe Derek Watt, whether you expect those guys to play this week? Yeah, I expect them both to play and uh, you know, be actively involved in practices. Uh, we'll know more really tomorrow. We don't do a bunch today. It's, it's a mental time out there on the field for us to start to understand schemes and get a jump on the opponents like we always do. But I think we'll get more, uh, we'll learn more as we get into Tuesday and Wednesday. But right now, I would expect them both to uh, participate and play. And um, I know they sure want to play. Andy. Gary, should we automatically assume that a team that has had a bye has an advantage over a team that is just got done playing a game? Um, you know, that's an, easy, that's an easy thing to assume. There's definitely a, a head start. That's a guarantee. They've had practice times on schemes and on reps and different scenarios that are out there. And you know, you always feel like you're a little bit behind, especially early in the week when a team has had a bye. Um, again, when you, when you have a bye, you got to be careful. You got to make sure when when you when you're preparing against a team that had a bye, I should say, you need to be careful. Just as I say, when you have a bye, you don't want to chase too many ghosts on the flip side and look way too far back at what the other opponent did. And I would say the same thing here. You get yourself caught in the middle of getting prepared for what they have done, and then because they've had a bye week, what they may do. And that can cause you a problem. So I think it's a delicate balance as you go through. And um, the key is to continue to prepare. But uh, you know, early in the week, right now, does Nebraska have an advantage because they had a bye week? Yes. And it's our job as coaches to eat that up. And as we practice, the player's responsibility to eat up the, the prep time that they've had. So when we uh, take the field, um, you know, we're, where we need to be to be ready to play. So yeah, buys are never an excuse for playing well or playing poorly. Eric? Uh, as crazy as it sounds, but after putting up 200 yards and, you know, he had a couple touchdowns, after the game, Melvin seemed more concerned about the fumble, the reads that he missed. Um, he even said something, like somebody asked him about uh, keeping track of Amir's statistics after every week, and he said, yeah, I do that. What is his demeanor on the sidelines? Is he a guy that sometimes you see that maybe he's pressing or trying to do too much, and if so, how do you guys deal with that as a coaching staff? No, I don't think he presses at all. It's, it's, it's competitive nature. You know, Melvin is, we've seen him come out and, and be sometimes have his best individual performances after a mistake or whatever it may be that he's had. Um, but I don't think that's, I think that's more just the situation that arises more so than, oh, Melvin all of a sudden is cranking it up and, hey, let's go. Um, but he, is, he does get down on himself. But a, a great competitor gets down on himself when he looks at something that he deems as a mistake or as an issue that uh, he should have done better or could have done better. And I credit him for that. But his demeanor has never been uh, down to the point to where, oh, well, he's not handling this well and not playing well because he hasn't had success. He's fantastic at that. Uh, he keeps his head up. He's very good with, you know, other guys when they have issues too that don't that may make a mistake. He's the first one to go over there and tap him on the head and say, "Hey, let's go." And um, he got a little bit of that from his teammates, which is great to see. And it doesn't surprise me from this team that they'll look at something that didn't go our way and they'll find a way to, you know, correct it through making a play and move on from the last snap. And that's the that's the key when you get in those scenarios. You can't you can't dwell on what the past was. You just got to move forward and try to do your best to uh, move throughout the game and make plays when opportunity presents itself. Jeff. Gary, just based on the stats, it looks like th their tackle, number seven on the inside, and then four, Gregory, yeah. Dan and Yates, are very disruptive. I'm just curious what you see about that tackle. And also, does Gregory stick to one side, or do they try to get mismatches for him on one side or the other? Gregory is really their three technique most of the time, um, which is playing in the B gap, I guess, without getting too technical. Uh, you know, He moves to the weak side or the strong side, depending on where they're going within the defensive scheme. Um, so he'll he he will play on both sides, and he's a very very talented player. He's stout and solid and physical against the run. Uh, very very talented pass rusher, change of direction guy. People have tried to do some different things to him in the read zone concepts, and he's shown for a big guy he can definitely not have much worry about uh, you know doing whatever he needs to do to get involved. And I would go way past that with that defensive front. They're they're talented, um, very very good. You know, pass rushers on the edges. Uh, that's a strength of their defense. Uh, 
which is a very good defense throughout, but a strength of their defense if they're on the tape. And maybe my eyes, again, always get drawn there because of my background coaching the defensive front. But there's a bunch of guys on that defensive line that uh, a lot of defensive coaches in the country would like to coach. Let me put it that way. They're good players. Andy? Gary, I don't know if this falls under the category of chasing ghosts, but did you watch the last, have you watched tape of the last Wisconsin-Nebraska game? No. Uh-uh. No, I have, I've, uh, I probably saw that 15 or 20 times on the Big Ten Network. So to say I watched the exact game tape of it, no, but uh, I've watched it quite a bit in, in the past. And um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's, it's always good to go back and compare schemes. I'm sure that Andy and Dave have gone back and done that. And I personally have not gone back that far. Gennaro. Gary, with the production and the division of snaps you had out of Tanner and uh, Joel, uh, quarterback, how much of that was something was what you envisioned, I guess, when you're thinking about this back in the off season or earlier in the season in terms of the ideal outcome and how do you you know, what can you do to build on that these last three games too? Um, well I think the key is is again that's just where we are at this point and uh, I've said it uh, I know this team believes it. The kids believe it that it is best for us to have both of those young men be ready to play. It, w it worked fantastic in this last game. It's it's worked good in some other games. Uh, the best thing for us, I believe, moving forward now that we're into the maturity part of this thing, into the season, to where those kids can handle going in and out, and the offense can handle them going in and out of series and moving on and off the field. That uh, you know, whenever you want them to, at whatever scenario that uh, Andy deems fit to put. Joel in there, put Tanner in there. Uh, it's even a little bit more of a vicious weapon. If I just look at it from a defensive coordinator standpoint, uh, would I, you know, rather defend a guy for a whole series or defend a guy maybe for a snap or two snaps and then have another guy come in? Um, they both have justification, but I personally think it's best when you have the ability to use them at any moment, um, and you have to adjust your defensive schemes to it. So you'll you'll see more of that as we continue to move forward and. Um, when opportunity presents itself through the games, there is no, hey, he's going to take 10 snaps, he's going to get 15 snaps, this other guy's going to get 50 snaps. It's you know kind of how the game is dictated, and uh, we'll use Tanner as we uh, deem fit, and he handled it very well last week, as well as did Joe. Along those lines, I know the, the guys both talked about having, having to adjust to splitting series at some point. And then yep. they also talked about, OK, that was a change last week. When, when Andy first approached you, did you have any, any reservations of how Joel might handle it because Tanner thought it's tougher for Joel if he's in a rhythm as a thrower to come out for a play or two and then come back in. But it didn't seem to have any negative effect. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if I really buy into that. I think if it works, then nobody wants to talk about it. If it doesn't work and he has a bad throw all of a sudden, then everybody's going to want to talk about it. Uh, you know, so many of those plays, they're, they're not designed throws that are in there in the moment. And to, you know, pull Tanner off when, or excuse me, pull Joel off and put Tanner in when you would be you know, handing the ball off, I guess I don't see that as a reason why we wouldn't throw the ball well. Um, and, you know, it, just the flexibility within the offense is, is a huge plus for us. And I, I just, uh, you know, all I can do is sit back and watch demeanor as a head coach, especially this late in the season, and look at the eyes of the kids and, you know, ask for them to, you know, truly continue to be invested in, in all the areas that we're asking to as coaches, and they do, and Tanner and Joel are at the forefront when it comes to that. They are all in, and they're excited about each other's success and the team's success. Andy? Gary, through the first four games, Vince Beagle had a one and a half tackles for loss mm -hmm. since, well, five games since. It's been pretty dramatic and on the other side of that. Did a light go on? Did schemes change? What what? prompted this this run of success for him in, in terms of that? Well, I would say, again, Vinny is a very, very talented athlete. And the more you play this game of football, you know, you gain confidence when you have success, just like anything in life. If you have success at what you're doing, you tend to get better at it. Uh, he has definitely improved in, in his ability to prepare. Um, his practice habits have always been fantastic from uh, an effort standpoint. But he's starting to understand some pre-snap awareness. He's starting to understand uh, as the game goes on to, you know, what is the guy I'm, I'm playing against? What is he like? And I think that's a, a maturity that goes through with a, a young man that has potential to be a great player who's playing very, very well at a high level the last few weeks. As he, the game kind of slows down for him a little bit as it, as it moves forward because he, he understands. He gets better as the game goes on because there's things on tape. Um, you know, you could watch 20 games and there's nothing like having 10 or 15 reps against somebody who you're playing against. And 
he's grown from that. Uh, I know he does because he talks about it. And then just the ability to be in the moment and, and understand where he's going. And his athleticism is showing up because his, he's loose. Um, he's full steam ahead. He's reacting. And that's what a great athlete can do on defense. When he becomes a reactor instead of thinking, he's a step faster. And that's how Vinny's been the last couple of weeks. And it's, it's all credit to that kid. He's a big part of that defense now. And he's a big time playmaker. Jim. Gary, I know you have a million other things to worry about during the week other than individual awards. But with, with Melvin being in the Heisman running, do you, do you embrace that? Do you encourage Melvin to embrace? I'm just curious on your mindset on that. Absolutely. Uh, Melvin wants that, and he's wanted it from the very beginning. And it goes back to the same deal I always talk about. There's a little bit of selfishness. If I'm a defensive tackle and defensive end, I want to I want to get there and make the tackles before the linebackers do. And there's nothing wrong with that attitude. And for Melvin to be an elite company as far as just a conversation of anything like that, I mean, that's that's as big as it gets. That's a special, special young man. And um, And I also would say that because I know – that Melvin can handle that. He has no problem. It's a driving force for him. It's a driving force for him to, to play better. And in turn, it helps his football team. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't worry about that, any of that stuff with Melvin at all. I, I really don't. It's not a, it's a, something that uh, I guess you could say he's a little bit used to. And ha he expected to be right where he is today at this moment and is excited to continue to compete and against you know the best in the country and th there's two of them they're going to be against each other on Saturday and I mean, what more could you really ask for in college football as a fan a coach or as a player it's a special time for those two young men and both these teams to have them matched up together for three hours and however many minutes it is. Jeff. Gary you mentioned Zach Zebski I'm just curious I remember when in that LSU game when you lost both Conrad and Warren obviously it really hurt the front but with Warren back now and with some of the reps the younger guys have gotten, are you better prepared if, if, Zags, if Zags is limited at all Saturday to, to handle that if he can't give you what he normally gives you? Yes, absolutely. You know, the, the, the trade-off with Warren being able to go to, to nose and the defensive end, and as he's come back, Warren's played more in the nose spot, but has the ability to flop out to end at any moment if he needed to, and Goldberg can come in and play the nose guard position. Um, that's positive for us. Um, you know, Kiefer came in, and I was really proud of him in this last game. Uh, he was physical. He made some plays. Uh, he was assignment clean. His technique was was very, very good, and it was good to see him get those quality reps because he's been waiting for that opportunity. He took advantage of it in this last game, and if Zags isn't there, he's going to have to this week against a you know a very good offensive line. So better equipped than we were, um, you know, with a couple of those freshmen hopping in there in the LSU game. Absolutely. Anything else? Anything else? Can you talk about the freedom trophy and significance? Um. <laughs> I didn't know there was a trophy to this game until about four or five days ago, so that I had no idea. Um, I guess I was too locked up in, in the season and seeing what's out there. So um, I guess my answer to that right now would be I haven't seen the trophy. I don't know what it looks like. I think what it uh, stands for is awesome. It's, it's, uh, it's great to have a trophy that stands, stands for something that special, especially with the traditions of both the, the stadiums and all the stuff that comes with it. So uh, sounds like it's there for all the right reasons. Kids have an opportunity to compete for something that they can you know, trade back and forth. As, uh, one of them is victorious throughout the years. Uh, always gives it a little bit of a special edge for the game. So I, I think it's good. Um, you know, pretty soon we're gonna have a trophy for every game we play. So at that point, it turns into little league, right? There's no winner, there's no loser. Just give them a trophy. Um, but I don't know. I, I it's, it's good. This one stands for all the right things. Anything else, for Coach? Thank you. Thanks. Go Badgers, I'm Wisconsin.